Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming to this semester's second O.P. Jindal Distinguished Lecture. I'm Ashutosh Varshney, director of the Brown India Initiative. Um, Sajjan and Sangeeta Jindal, uh, Brown Parents 2012, endowed these lectures in memory of O.P. Jindal, Sajjan's deceased father. And the purpose of this endowment is to promote a discussion of the politics, economics, society, and culture of contemporary India here at Brown. <clears throat> um, before I introduce the speaker and invite our director to chair the proceedings, let me say a few words about the topic of the lecture. The topic is India-Pakistan relations, can we move forward? As I said on Friday, when Minister Khushid gave his first lecture, when the British uh, left India in 1947, there were nearly 100 million Muslims in India out of a total population of 400 million. 35 million Muslims became citizens of India and 65 million citizens of Pakistan. The two countries thus emerged from a similar past, but have not shared a common present and it is unclear when they will have a common future, if at all. <clears throat> they fought three full-fledged wars, 1947 through 49, 47 to 48 more precisely, 1965 and 1971, and another battle in 1999 uh, that came to be called the Kargil War. Tensions have repeatedly flared up on the border and unlike the unsettled India-China border, where skirmishes do not lead to deaths, border clashes between India and Pakistan, often flaring up, have led to many, many casualties. In addition, there is the highly debated and contested notion of the links between terrorism and security. There are several explanations for the ongoing tensions and hostilities, nearly unending, Pakistan's principal argument is that until the Kashmir question is settled, there cannot be peace. Many scholars, however, also point to a different explanation. They say that the foundations of Pakistan's identity have uh, an irreducible core of anti-Indianism. That is to say, it is hard for Pakistan to imagine itself as a nation without its anti-Indian core, at least minimally. In short, according to this argument, Kashmir is a symptom, not a cause. Christine Fair, recently tenured at Georgetown University and now uh, um, an author of a widely read book, Fighting to the End, has provided the most recent version of this argument after reading the Pakistani military's own text for the last 30 years, of the last 30 years, Christine Fair argues that Pakistan is ideology driven, not security driven. A standard security calculus emphasizing the primacy of national interest and a calibration of costs and benefits would have demonstrated the necessity of compromise with India so this is straight from international security literature. Um, lots and lots of theories about this. But Fair writes, and I quote, for Pakistan's men on horseback, not winning, even repeatedly, is not the th same thing as losing. Simply giving up and accepting the status quo and India's supremacy is by definition defeat, unquote. Further, Pakistan's army sees victory simply, quote, as the ability to continue fighting with India, unquote. As the ability to continue fighting regardless of consequences for the nation's development, welfare, or international opinion. So is Kashmir a symptom or a cause? Either way, how can we move forward? Can we? Few Indians are better placed to answer these questions than our speaker today, Salman Khurshid. In the first half of the 1990s, he was India's junior minister of external affairs. And his last assignment in government was as India's senior minister of external affairs, a position equal to the US Secretary of State. 
He has not only held these important positions where he's taken decisions, but as a writer, a public intellectual, and a former professor of Oxford, he's also had time to reflect deeply about India's relationship with Pakistan. Edward Steinfeld, my colleague and director of the Watson Institute, is in the chair. I have specially invited him because he's a scholar of Chinese politics. In the scholarly and policy discussions of India-Pakistan relations, the US is normally analyzed as a third party. Given what's happening to world politics today and what's likely to happen, it is becoming increasingly clear that China's role in India-Pakistan relations might be more significant than it has been in the past, in addition, of course, to the US role. I'm not suggesting China will replace US as, quote unquote, the third party, but it will become a much more significant player in the coming years in the India-Pakistan relationship. May I now invite Ed to chair the proceedings? Ed. Thank you, Ashu. I think what would be best if you introduce Minister Farshid and he'll speak first. Yes, he will speak first. I introduced him at length on Friday. Okay. Um, I have, I'm now introducing him as not only a former junior minister and senior minister of external affairs, but as a, as, a, as a leading public intellectual and as a writer and as a former professor of Oxford who's thought very deeply about India-Pakistan relations. And I know you're all here to hear Minister Farshid. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to you. Okay. I will offer a few minutes of commentary afterward, and then we'll open it up to, to the audience. Thank you. Minister Farshid, thanks for this. Well, good afternoon to, to all of you again. I've had the privilege to have, have had some of you in the audience on uh, Friday. Um, and I'm delighted that um, those who were here and others have been able to join, uh, join us this, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to Director Edward Sandfeld for presiding over today's, uh, today's lecture. And of course, as always, I have to acknowledge uh, a deep gratitude to uh, to Dr. Ashutosh Varshney for having brought me here um, and given me an opportunity to refresh my mind um, away from, from the, the, uh, the daily concerns of, of politics and, and other dimensions of my life in, in India, to reflect upon things that we are doing there and to see whether you get a better picture from the salubrious surroundings of this beautiful university. So thank you very much for being here. Um, when, uh, when we spoke about these uh, lectures the other day, I acknowledged, uh, acknowledged my um, great, great admiration for, for Mr. Sajjan and Sangeeta Jindal for having instituted these lectures, um, remembered fondly the time that I've spent with Mr. O.P. Jindal and his other son, um, again, a very, very uh, dear, dear friend of mine, and I'm so glad that this particular strong link uh, with India has been established uh, between your, your university and, uh, and our country. Uh, as we spoke about what I was to say today, um, uh, Ashutosh said that, you know, uh, asked me if it would be entirely analytical or would there be an element of a personal narrative. And I thought that that's what he was, in a sense, looking for to provide a slightly, slightly variant, different um, outlook uh, and perception, uh, <coughs> in a sense influenced by, uh, by what one sees in, in, in person. Uh, and therefore, uh, you will probably find a lot of that um, mixed with, with some element of, of analysis. Um, so here goes, and I hope that uh, It'll be rewarding for you. The uh, ine inevitability of, of partition, as we see it today, uh, remains fiercely debated, uh, both at scholarly levels and at uh, and the level of ordinary people in India, uh, because repeatedly uh, some event, both wholesome or unwholesome, uh, focuses our attention back to why did this happen in the first place? Why did India and Pakistan have to be have to be divided? Um, and I do believe that uh, whatever was the cause um, at that point of time, 
neither Pakistan nor India have been able to resolve some of the implications of that, that particular cause. And we <coughs> remain puzzled in our country, and I believe uh, Pakistan remains, uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, uh, completely, completely captivated by the idea of what they call the unfinished agent of, of partition. They talk uh, repeatedly, uh, I, as I, um, I understand they must, about UN resolutions that for them holds out the promise of uh, resolution. Uh, we speak repeatedly about bilateral uh, disputes that are to be settled in the spirit of, of similar agreement. Um, on both sides, I think we continue to look at uh, whatever is happening, and as, as uh, Ashutosh said, um, uh, at the symptoms of the problem rather than the root of the problem and the problem itself. Uh, we seem to have forgotten, almost forgotten, why it happened. Uh, and we continue to worry about the uh, consequences of what happens and continues to happen. And therefore, uh, perhaps uh, the preoccupation prevents us from looking into the crystal ball um, to look at the way ahead. Can we move forward? And my answer really is that can we move forward is a little more difficult than to say we must move forward. There is no option for India and Pakistan but to move forward. But will it happen in our lifetime or will it not happen in our lifetime is the, is the big question. In dealing with this uh, very exciting, may I say excru excruciating subject as well, um, as I said, I will draw upon some experiences which are of a personal nature and which I believe in a sense will help in the analytical uh, attempts as well. Um, I will draw upon uh, some personal experiences, both uh, of my own as indeed of, um, of the country. But to put it in perspective, uh, very, very briefly, and that again, I think has been spoken of in the last lecture and here, India's Muslim population. Um, the figures vary, but I think these are workable figures. Pakistan's uh, population is about 11% of the world's Muslim population, uh, small, majority, small minority of Sikhs, Christians, and Hindus. India has a minority population of 18% uh, uh, of a total population of 1.2 billion. And amongst these, Muslims are the largest majority, or 10.9% of world Muslims, a little more of uh, India's population, 13 or 14%. Or uh, that does make India the largest, third largest population in the world after Indonesia and Pakistan. Some people believe we may actually have more than uh, the population of Pakistan, but certainly by 2050, we will be uh, most likely the largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, we've strenuously striven to preserve ourselves as a secular society, but find that Pakistan feels more comfortable in thinking of us as Hindu India, referring to India as Bharat, the name that, curiously, even the BJP now uh, has stopped using and prefers to use the word, uh, the name Hindustan. The, the partition of 1947 divided land and families but did not and could not obliterate blood relationships. I'm myself part of a family, members of which have served the two countries with unwavering fidelity and distinction. One brother, Dr. Zakir Hussain, served as president of India, whilst his younger brother, Dr. Mahmood Hussain, served as vice chancellor of Dhaka and Karachi universities and ultimately Pakistan's education minister. A cousin of mine, Anwar Hussain, was a speechwriter for the then President of Pakistan, General Ziaul Haq, when I was writing speeches for Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Anwar Hussain was the newsreader who announced the election of Dr. Zakir Hussain as the President of India. I believe our family members might well have fought wars against each other, uh, and I, I have some, some uh, reason to believe that uh, uh, we may have had uh, uh, some, some fatal incidents as well. Similarly, 
Salim Shirvani, who served as Minister of State External Affairs, uh, has a cousin who works closely with him, who is a twin of, uh, of uh, a gentleman who now is uh, in Pakistan as part of a family arrangement when the twins were born. During my visit to Pakistan in the Karachi Literary Festival, several people walked up and introduced themselves as relatives who I had no reason to recognize. Uh, could there thus be a greater demand that society can make upon its members? But if that seems unusual, let me share with you a story that I was told by a friend, Maruf Raza, who received the Sword of Honor at the Indian Military Academy and has since gone on to civilian life as a strategic expert. And I think you probably see him on, on television programs from India. The story he told me, and he subsequently reproduced it in print, left me speechless and wondering if intensity of feeling it evokes will ever be fully realized by people on either side of the border. And I want to read that story out to you. And I am sure that it will leave you equally speechless. At a dinner party in New Delhi, an elegant gentleman walked up to me and asked if I was serving in the Indian Army. This is Maru Freda. My haircut perhaps gave this away. As I answered in the affirmative, I was then an instructor of the Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. Uh, when I inquired if he had any military connections, he replied, yes. His two elder brothers had both been officers. To this, my natural response was, what were their regiments then? He then said with a smart, sad smile, let me tell you a story. Several years earlier, he had run into the military attache. This is Maruf as I had run into the military uh, attache, uh, uh, one Brigadier Beg in India at a circuit house uh, on the Delhi Ahmedabad Highway. During the course of their conversation and on learning that he was an Indian Muslim, the Pakistani brigadier admitted that it was only in 1965 war that he learned that Muslim officers also served in the Indian Army. Indian Army's Armored Corps tanks uh, had made substantial gains in the fierce battles in the Sialkot sector of Punjab's Punjab, Pakistan's Punjab. Um, many may well, uh, n many well-known armored units uh, were part of India's first armored division. Uh, such as the Pune and the Hodgson's Horse, Second Lancers, Third, Sixteenth, and Eighteenth Cavalry. Pakistan's armored division, despite its apparently superior tank units, was in retreat as the commanders desperately needed a tactical break. It was at this stage of the war, around 8 September of 1965, that the Pakistani brigadier, then a young lieutenant, was summoned by his brigade commander. He was asked to undertake a commando raid into Indian frontline positions around Sialkot and tasked to eliminate one, of the more, one or more Indian tank commanders. The young Pakistani officer, then a lieutenant, set out on the 8th, 9th September night before dawn and sneaked into his target area as Indian tanks were preparing for another day's battle. In those days, in the absence of night vision devices, tank battles were largely fought during daylight. He identified a squadron commander's tank, climbed atop unnoticed in the roar of the tank engines. Inside the open cupola, he spotted a major pouring over ma maps planning for another day's battle. With no time to lose, Lieutenant Bake shot the Indian major through the head. But before leaving the wounded Indian officer, he decided to take along some proof of having accomplished his mission. He unbuttoned the shoulder flaps of the Indian major, pulled out the cloth epaulets of his rank from his shoulders. On this was also embroidered the 16th Cavalry, the title of his regiment. In the breast pocket of the major, he also found a holy pendant, a tavis. His job done, the young lieutenant with his raid party quickly crossed back into his Pakistani territory. Um, lieutenant Beg immediately went to report to his brigade commander that he had accomplished his mission, pulled out the bullets of rank badges and the holy pendant of the Indian Army major he had shot. The brigadier became inexplicably Tense. As Lieutenant Bay wondered whether the brigadier was upset uh, at his having killed an Indian Muslim officer, the latter's hands began to shake and his emotions swelled. His voice became heavy and his eyes filled with tears as he slumped into his chair. Lieutenant Bay again asked the brigadier what the problem was. In a voice choked with emotion, the latter said, Young man, I hadn't the foggiest idea the 16th Cavalry was pitted against us. 
Then after a pause, he said, Major M.A.R. Sheikh, whom you have killed, was my younger brother. When Lieutenant Baik finished telling the story, the attentive listener told the Pakistani officer, Brigadier, it may surprise you to know that the two brothers you have spoken about were both older to me. I am the youngest of the three. And as he stared in disbelief, the narrator of this tale requested Brigadier Baik to visit his family home, which is only a few hours' drive from where they were, to meet his aged mother, who had always wanted to meet someone who had fought against her son. When the Pakistani brigadier met the old Begum the next day, who of course didn't know that her son had died of wounds inflicted by the brigadier, she seemed pleased that the enemy thought well of her son. Records show that Major Sheikh died of wounds in his head sustained battle near Sialkot on the 10th of September 1965. He was posthumously awarded the gallantry award of a Veer Chakra. His brother, the brigadier, rose to become a general in the Pakistan Army. When I repeated this story to an August audience in Islamabad some months ago, one distinguished retired armored corps general responded by saying, I was wrong about the Pakistani units being surrounded by Indian tanks. To me, that made it clear that many of us are still talking about things that are irrelevant, refusing to grasp our shared destiny. <clears throat> there are undoubtedly innumerable similar stories of personal loss and tragedy in the landscape of the two hostile neighbors who share a past, an invaluable common heritage, links of language, civilized bonds, civilizational bonds, etc., but remain uncomfortable about the future and unable to shake off their past. If the, if the entire nations can be described as being bipolar, it is the two of us. We yearn for each other, celebrate our meetings on the cricket and hockey pitches, applaud each other's artists, and yet remain strangers with deep-rooted suspicion. We snipe at each other at all international fora, pour scarce resources into military preparedness instead of improving the loves of, uh, lives of millions of impoverished and disadvantaged citizens. The nuclear arsenals of our two countries are an additional worry for the world, despite both sides knowing that we can never use them without causing incalculable damage to ourselves. Pakistan's Jammu and Kashmir obsession has caused it to be confined to a single issue foreign policy, often at a considerable cost itself, as well as to other countries of the region by stultifying the potential of SARC. Similarly, India's preoccupation with threat perception despite objective circumstances and the possibility of a prolonged and decisive war having change irreversibly keeps us self-conscious and relatively distracted from a larger role in the changing world. We have demanded of countries like the U.S. to give up treating India in a hyphenated relationship with Pakistan, and in recent years with great difficulty managed to get some cosmetic satisfaction without actual substance, substantive transformation. In furthering our relations with Afghanistan, Turkey, China, etc., the issue of Pakistan retards our efforts not to speak of irritations caused by unwelcome pronouncements of the OIC, despite individual members of the organization being on excellent terms with us. Since 1947 and the partition, the world has found imaginative solutions to several intractable disputes and conflicts while India-Pakistan confrontation has remained unchanged. However, what was seen at one time as the most dangerous place in the world has become subject to global fatigue and of late taken over by the AFPAC syndrome. The reunification of Vietnam, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, the resolution of European civil strife and the dissolution of Yugoslavia, the resolution of the Irish crisis and the peace agreement with the IRA, the last with remarkable insights for India and Pakistan, the peaceful transition of USSR into Russian Federation and Central Asian republics are, are but a few examples of the unthinkable being achieved by a single generation of remarkable state persons. The end of apartheid in South Africa, the peaceful emergence of Central Asian republics, as I said, are reminders to us in India and Pakistan that peace is not only possible in our lives, but also an imperative for humankind. Where then can we and must we begin afresh? Let us look at JNK with a new outlook. Why really must Pakistan continue to show special interest in Kashmir? 
If it is for the Muslim population of the state, does it matter that India's vast Muslim population does not accept the view that any adverse consequences in terms of Jammu and Kashmir would inevitably have negative impact on the entire majority of India, minority of India? Indian Muslims have fought and laid down their life for land and the idea of India. Brigadier Usman and Havildar Abdul Hamid are names that stand out amongst the Legion of Martyrs. Fifty years on, Pakistan will not be doing justice to the Muslims of India by creating a situation, by, 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 uh, uh, by creating a situation that their allegiance to the land where they were born remains on constant test. It is a strange irony that Indian leaders who are immensely popular in Pakistan from time to time have all been Hindus, from Atal Bihari Bajpayee to Lalu Prashad Yadav and Mani Shankar Iyer. Muslim leaders in India neither get similar adulation nor indeed even seek such attention. Are Indian Muslim leaders too self-conscious to seek a favorable constituency in Pakistan and the latter reluctant to acknowledge them, having dubbed them as Sarkari Muslims for decades? Curiously, the interest shown by Pakistani leaders and diplomats to reach out to the Hurriyat is not shown even in reduced measure in developing relations with Muslim leaders in the rest of India. So many decades after the idea of Pakistan, the two-nation theory, and the idea of India, its total repudiation clashed and pushed us to the brink of partition. Truthfully, neither idea has reached absolute fulfillment. Although two decades ago, we mustered the courage to objectively examine the state of Muslims in India when the Satcher Committee and the Chief Justice Rangnath Mishra Commission handed down their far-reaching recommendations. Of course, despite sincere efforts to implement the recommendations of our then government, UPA2, of which I was a member, we were merely able to take the first steps of a far-sighted justice project. The moderate success gave little satisfaction to a community whose expectations suddenly exploded, but invited undeserved hostility from majority egged on by the then main opposition, the BJP. The ideological resistance of the BJP in power has put the entire justice project in cold storage to await the return of secular politics. Crucial as this, as this is to the idea of India, yet it is not the only dimension that has a lesson for steering our relationship with Pakistan. The continuous reworking of the state's reorganization commission with periodic demands for bifurcation or trifurcation of existing states, this time not only on language or cultural differences, but due to regional disparities, has some insights for review of political approach that led to Pakistan, uh, in the partition one, which is India and Pakistan, and partition two, which is Pakistan and Bangladesh, and continues to feed the urge for another virtual partition re Jammu and Kashmir. In a similar manner, first Punjab and Haryana, then Bihar and Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, not to mention several states born out of erstwhile Punjab, have all emerged into separate existence. The argument that the vast expanse of erstwhile states made democratic administration difficult, if not impossible, is no longer valid because of modern technology and communications. Yet the demands overwhelm all arguments and, and efforts to the contrary. We have not had the opportunity to conduct an exercise to assess the gains made by bifurcation of states, though there is enough e evidence for more rapid growth of the newly created states. But of course, there are many other aspects of the aspiration and its ultimate fulfillment that scholars and political observers will amplify in due course. Inevitably, the interdependence of new states will be greater than between those in the previous arrangement. Whether that interdependence will grow into common approaches leading to some form of local federal arrangements to begin with informal and later more structured or formal is anyone's guess. But there is no reason that a similar thing would not happen in assessing what India and Pakistan have gained or lost in parting. Either way, it may not be a rewarding exercise to look at hypotheticals of what might have been our state without partition or whether partition was inevitable. Given that history is etched deep in our psyche, the analysis can at best give us some direction on what we continue to lose because of our inability to repair our estranged relationship. If, as the scholars suggest, the concept of imagined communities has remained incomplete for inherent 
invalid invalidity, must we continue to pay lip service to it? Instead, working towards a grand reconciliation may give us the elusive break through, though, uh, through which we have been looking for. The imagination that caused the rupture between India and Pakistan is the very imagination that can be generated to create a new reality that assures prosperity and comfort on both sides. The possibility of cooperative growth between our two countries can be judged by the potential of gas lines from Iran and Central Asia across Pakistan to Indian destinations. This would only state the obvious, that there is an unlocked interdependence between India and Pakistan, not to speak of the multiplier effect of our cooperation, imagination and identity are the primary motivation in postmodern world where imagination and discovery were to be our constant companions. In this equation, if this equation goes wrong, the noblest of dreams turn into nightmares. We have seen it happen in the Arab Spring. We have seen it happen in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Balkans, and now in Crimea and Ukraine. Perhaps uh, a famous Pakistan poet that we treat as an Indian poet too, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, has put our predicament, had our predicament in mind when he wrote the following lines, and I, I'll say them in Urdu and then and give a translation. غم اور بھی ہیں دنیا میں محبت کے سوا تو جو مل جائے تو تقدیر نگوں ہو جائے یوں نہ تھا میں نے فقط چاہا تھا یوں ہو جائے اور بھی دکھ ہیں زمانے میں محبت کے سوا رہتیں اور بھی ہیں وصل کی راحت کے سوا There are sorrows plenty in the world what to speak of unrequited love To get you would change life immeasurably It was not to be, I know I had only hoped for it to be so There are sorrows in the world beyond the sorrows of love. There are reliefs too, other than the relief of being united in love. It is ironic that the most near breakthroughs between India and Pakistan take place when the Pakistani army is in direct control of the government in Islamabad. To think that the very institution whose stated raison d'etre is to pr protect Pakistan from what is an imaginary threat of India, amongst other objectives, should also be the instrument of better understanding in relations is ironic in the extreme. Of course, this might be contested, but the fact remains that even now people speak with great confidence of the musharraf Bajpai deal that unfortunately was aborted. The politi political schizophrenia in Pakistan is explained by the felt desire, desire need of an I identified enemy to rally the nation for a common cause when the military is not in government and a display of virtuosity in pulling off diplomatic successes when in government to expand the governance profile beyond domestic politics. Equally, the Indian political system remains severely constrained by self-consciousness due to the BJP pressure when the party is in opposition, but quickly opens up to fresh initiatives once in office. It is uh, not only understood, always understood that India has a stake in the success of Pakistan far greater and the counter-argument against its initial conception. History has long bypassed the latter, while real politics and contemporary world reality points to the former as an imperative. A successful Pakistan would have less reason to search for a unifying external object of hostility, while it is equally true that a successful India will break free of its convenient obsession with toxic, imagined Pakistan to address its problems in right earnest. This is no occasion to reflect on a definitive theory of what ultimately caused partition of India, and there are many different versions, as I've said, but in any version, there's inevitably are ingredients of ideology and political tactics. Given the passage of time and dramatic changes in the world ideology, need not be diluted, but can all at least be tested for contextual relevance, while tactics certainly give way to change conditions. Perhaps I, I, I need to publicly record uh, my, my opinion of what uh, President, the Prime Minister, Mia Nawaz Sharif, uh, seems to be doing vis-a-vis -vis relationship with India. I do believe that he's generally committed to peace with India and has more than once put himself in considerable discomfort to find an opening beyond pious incantations. I'm not entirely sure uh, how much the larger Pakistani establishment supports this. Um, I do realize that, that any efforts that are, are made by either country see uh, impediments and obstructions appear overnight, as happened 
in the recent visit of our Prime Minister to Pakistan, unannounced to a family event of Mr. Nawaz Sharif's family, uh, to be followed only by horrific events in Pathan Court just a few days, few days later. Um, although several Indian Prime Ministers from Atal Bihari Bajpayee and Dr. Manmohan Singh have made sincere efforts to find a small window to reach out, each time one notices a little movement, there's something waiting around the corner to stall progress, as though um, there are powerful forces that will not allow normalization of relations. The Bajpayee bus ride was followed by Kargil and the endeavor of Dr. Manmohan Singh, derailed by a reference to Baluchistan at Sharm el Sheikh and the repeated horrifying incidents of beheading of captured Indian soldiers. The arrest of uh, one Mr. Jadav appears, in, uh, appears to India to be a clever but cynical ploy to distract attention once again. Unfortunately, some Indian Chinese have <coughs> foolishly given grace to the mill. Most recently, Prime Minister Na Na Narendra Modi too would have been taken aback by the Pathan court attack just when he thought he'd made a personal breakthrough with PM Nawaz Sharif. Truth is that no one seems to know what really is the answer to the problem. Interestingly, despite the fact that Indian Prime Ministers seek to add peace with Pakistan uh, feathers to their cap, Indian elections seldom get influenced by foreign policy, leave alone Pakistan. But beyond election period, it comes handy to earn legacy points for the ruling party and some negatives for it at the hands of the opposition. Mr. Modi started off with a strong, no-nonsense attitude towards Pakistan that fit with his approach towards the Muslims in the country. On the eve of taking office, he was still talking of no talk and terrorism at the same time. His foreign minister had already spoken of 10 heads for each martyred soldier. For the first time, there was tough talk on Pakistan overlapping with the election campaign. Yet hours later, he was being applauded for a game-changer invitation to Nawaz Sharif to open to, to the open air oath ceremony at Rashpati Bhavan. But it was not long before keen observers could see things go wrong. Indian media space, Indian media space was full of uh, a riot act being read to the Prime Minister of Pakistan. The latter canceled his press conference and upon his return to Pakistan, he had a we told you so written all over. Several similar incidents, despite the generous gifts from each other's, each other's parents or mothers, the unannounced trip to the Sharif family wedding have brought us to square one. Prime Minister Modi's long-term plans for Pakistan are not yet evident, but then that could be said about his other policies as well. But perhaps the key to his approach lies in judging his self-esteem and confidence. Mr. Modi in his present avatar is a product of successive electoral successes and unquestioned authority. He certainly believes that he has irresistible charm that makes him a star. His performances at large gatherings of seemingly ecstatic overseas Indians are an ample proof of it. But at the end of the day, he too must get beyond the hugs and kisses. He will have to understand Pakistan, and Pakistan will have to understand him. Beginning with suspicion that was understandable, there is a sense of confidence that Modi has the capacity to find a lasting solution. Yet they forget that Dr. Manmohan Singh once said to his counterpart, no Indian prime minister can give Kashmir away. The myopic inability to accept the time and world events have, been, have not been at a standstill since 1947 prevents us from truly addressing our concerns. So instead of attacking the disease, we continue symptomatic treatment, look at the trade and then retreat, look at Siachin and then move on to something else, agree to talks about terrorism only to have Pakistan pretend it was about terrorism in Pakistan. In 50 years, a common language, art forms, cuisine, sports, literature continue to fascinate and yet keep us divided. While each of these are yearned for in the other country, we see attempts to ban Indian films in Pakistan and obstruction of sports and cultural events by Pakistanis in India. Complementary economic conditions have not changed despite the passage of half a century and half and huge dividends await the opening of borders. The gas pipeline, free transportation, trade can make our region transform itself in profound ways. Yet, we continue to cut the nose to spite the face. Pakistan is not alone in being subjected to a wave of iconoclastic and disruptive activities. We have our own versions of intolerance, 
that have questioned much that the world associates with Indian civilization, and what we may, of course, many of us consider to be part of the definition of India, enunciated in the Constitution of the Republic and brilliantly expounded by the Supreme Court. The narrative, not surprisingly, involves Pakistan as a compulsory destination of gratuitous advice given to Muslims by none other than important members of the ruling family, ruling party, as well as warning for the result of misguided election votes that protagonists unselfconsciously pronounced would lead to celebrations in Pakistan. The recent Bihar Assembly election campaign was explicitly communal in nature, and it is remarkable that voters who had 18 months ago enthusiastically supported Narendra Modi refused to influ be influenced by their narrow rhetoric. Even more commendable was the quiet determination of Muslims who rejected Ovesi's appeal to show their strength by voting for his party. The result was an unprecedented rout of the BJP, leading to several senior leaders of the BJP demanding accountability publicly. How this will impact the government and its social policy is still very early to predict. It has to be noted that Prime Minister Modi had no experience of defeat for two decades till Bihar happened. Similarly, he has little experience of conversations with people other than his admirers or those who are accustomed to merely taking orders. Diplomatic challenges are often quite different in nature of, of conversations that need to be undertaken. Since Pakistan has to deal with him for the next three years or so, its leadership will need to understand the counterpart. We will wait to see whether <coughs> Prime Minister Modi figures out the diplomacy he has to conduct will be vastly different from the politics he has successfully done so far. Whether Bihar will convince him that he must change his politics as well remains the big question dependent on the imponderables of Indian politics. Allow me to simply conclude by saying that India and Pakistan need to look beyond now and here, certainly beyond yesterday, towards a remarkable future they can both share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Khosheed, for that um, profound and profoundly moving talk. Maybe if I could just say a comment or two about, um, about China and how China may or may not play into some of the issues that you raised. And, I, and here I'm speaking as somebody who studies China, but not somebody who studies geopolitics per se. So forgive my comments for being, um, of course, quite superficial. Uh, I really want to raise three quick points in response. Uh, one is a, a basic point of geography which isn't lost on most people in this room, but which I think is lost on many Americans. Uh, a number of years ago when I was uh, living in China on sabbatical, I happened to be doing some work with a, um, a colleague of mine who was a uh, retired American official in the security domain. And I mentioned to this individual, we, we were chatting over the phone, I mentioned that I just returned from China's border with Pakistan. And he said, China has a border with Pakistan? So that, that's, that's an interesting response. And I think for most Americans, the idea of China being a neighbor of the India-Pakistan division, it's a, it's a very hard thing to get one's mind around for most Americans. So China is a country roughly the size of the United States. Many Americans have in their mind, when they think of China, the East Coast and cities like Shanghai or Beijing. They don't have in their mind the western interior as far away from Shanghai as roughly San Francisco or Los Angeles is from New York, but Chinese for sure have in their mind the western interior of the country. If one travels, as some of you I know have, to the far western Chinese province of Xinjiang, one can travel from Kashgar south on the Karakoram Highway, the only really improved road in the area, a nicely developed two-lane highway through the extraordinary scenery of the Karakoram Range, the Pamir Plateau, and into the Hindu Kush. And if one travels south along that highway, one will see, in addition to extraordinary scenery, one sees um, line after line of mining vehicles coming down, bringing ore from various mining concerns, state-owned mining concerns, and one sees a great deal of military and one sees a great deal of local population, none of which really is Chinese. So what does one see as one drives down that Karakoram Highway? Very much in the Chinese sentiment, very much part of China. The Karakoram Highway is known as the China-Pakistan Friendship Highway. One travels south 
roughly 60 kilometers in succession from the borders with Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, small border, and then ultimately one arrives at the border with Pakistan. And that border is, uh, I've been there only once, but I'll say on my visit, uh, it's the highest paved border in the world at roughly 15,000 feet. But the border is full of traffic, truck traffic, and full of commerce and full of activity. And I think that's indicative of a long history, as you all know, of a rather friendly relationship with Pakistan and China, and a relationship that um, many Chinese, of course we can't speak for everybody, but many Chinese, Chinese media, the Chinese state, view it as a long-lasting, friendly, and incredibly important geostrategic relationship, not just important for China's positioning in South Asia or Central Asia, but incredibly important for the domestic security of China, for the domestic security and the continued passivity and pacification of, of the Muslim population in Western China. So just the first point about geography and the difficulty I have, at least, of getting my mind around that idea that Pakistan and the Pakistan-India conflict is very much viewed in China as not just an international matter, but one of domestic salience and security. Second point. Um, perhaps partly because of the very rapid development of China and the uh, very rapid development, I'm sorry, of India and the prominence of the Modi government and um, I think the growing ability of India to project power in, in, in good ways and soft ways and hard ways, but the ability to project power has changed, I think, the way that um, both India and Pakistan are presented in China in the media and are discussed among educated people in, in China. And that, of course, is not unrelated to the positioning of the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis China. So just to, to, to be a little more clear about this, I think it's fair to say that many, many Chinese today, among <coughs> educated Chinese, liberal Chinese, take it as a matter of course that the United States officially is trying to contain China's growth today and is systematically Try, whether we agree with this position or not, I think it's widely understood in China, accepted as a matter of course, that the United States has determined that it will contain China's growth. And in that sense, the United States, from the Chinese perspective, is quite clear, carefully and closely aligned with India and the objectives of the Modi government. And the Indians, whether we agree with this position or not, widely accepted in China, and the Indians are quite closely aligned with the Japanese, who are also, of course, being egged on by the Americans, who are all trying to contain China. I mention all that to say that it's increasingly, I think, just taken as a matter of course, that the Pakistan relationship within China, that the Pakistan alliance is essential, essential for domestic pacification and es es essential for deterring Indian expansiveness and American expansiveness. And the, the, just the third and final point I want to raise, and of course none of these I'm raising with any kind of normative intent or judging them, but simply trying to, I think, project as much as I can what's taken as common knowledge in China. The third thing is that the, this official statement in China about um, one belt, one road, idai lu. Yes, of course, these statements are, are somewhat propagandistic and uh, what should be taken with uh, um, a measure of skepticism. But this idea that China is reorienting somewhat away from the traditional view outward in the Pacific, more toward a view, frankly, to the West and into Central Asia and South Asia, and that whole repositioning or maybe return to the Silk Road attitude of the past, I don't think that's wholly false. And I don't think it's just a figment of many people's imagination in China. We're seeing investments moving in that area. We're seeing, uh, broadly speaking, we're seeing um, increasing accounts in the media. We're seeing increasing attention in the social sciences and the humanities, let alone the sciences and in commerce in China. And what, what, what that's to say, and I'll say this in conclusion, is that the, that the American idea that issues of Pakistan and India are at best an issue of China's frontier, far western frontier, or even the Chinese idea among some that these are issues of the far interior frontier, a place dangerous, better not visited 
I think that's an attitude of the past. And increasingly, those issues of the frontier are becoming the issues of, issues of, of, of core centrality in China, every much as central as the relationship with the United States or the relationship with Japan. All the more reason to take what Minister Khoshid said very seriously, take it into account, and add not just the U.S., but China into the picture as well, hopefully someday as a part of the solution, but at least in the near term as an um, unavoidable part of the equation. Thank you. Thank you. And you also chair. Thank you. Um, I know Minister Hoshid will have ample opportunity to respond to what I just said. Would you like to take a minute or two, or do you want to just respond to, to questions? Yeah, I, I think that um, I, I mentioned I, I mentioned China, China in passing because I, I I find it's a very complicated relationship. You just mentioned something about uh, about Japan, um, and I uh, I have a degree of discomfort about uh, how we've tried to play China against Japan and Japan against China. It's, it's a very, very difficult, uh, difficult uh, conundrum. Uh, but we had, uh, in, up to the previous government, we, we kept a balanced balance approach. Uh, we never uh, categorically, categorically uh, repudiated any position that China took on, on South China Sea or East China Sea, as it might be. Um, uh, we did speak of, of uh, freedom of navigation, but we didn't go beyond that. Uh, but it seems that, that Mr. Mr. Modi's government uh, is, is, is more explicit, uh, but he seems to think that what is said in, in Japan will not be noticed in China, and what is said in China will not be noticed in Japan. Uh, this is, for us, I think, as a foreign policy uh, matter, this is very... Uh, 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 very tricky, uh, very sensitive, and could have far-reaching, far-reaching implications. And, uh, we have been working uh, with China in a very patient and steady, step-by-step -step manner. That was our approach. Uh, we thought the Chinese had stopped being as inscrutable as they were in the past, but several rounds of of uh, uh, the. Uh, the spe special uh, special uh, representatives uh, meeting to talk about about uh, uh, issues on the border were going well were going well but uh, Mr. Modi I think is a little bit impatient and that's uh, the, the worst thing that you can do with China is to be impatient uh, Chinese uh, take great uh, emphasize uh, uh, at great length, the the, the idea of of uh, a civilizational view of life, and and therefore it's not something that you can um, you can fix in in a moment. And Mr. Modi seems to be in a hurry, and that doesn't go down well uh, go go down well with China. Again, on the Pakistan front, we are uh, uh, I myself had uh, conversations with the Chinese leadership um, on the developments that are happening in, in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and where Chinese contractors and Chinese companies are, are most uh, generally involved. And I've inevitably heard from them saying that these are private, these are private uh, companies, that these are not, these are not government companies, uh, but we'll take on board your, your concerns and so on. I think it has to be a very steady, long-term conversation uh, with China. China's uh, interest in India is in terms of investment, but it would want investment to come in on certain conditionalities. India needs Chinese investment because there is no other way of balancing uh, the trade between India and China. But um, we don't want their, their investment to be noticed. I mean, China's investment in any part of the world uh, is very sp specifically noticed as Chinese investment. I don't think that the, the way we have dealt with our, uh, our perceptions of our population, that that's something that could work quickly and in a hurry. So it's a long journey as f and, a long, uh, and, a, and a high hill to climb as far as our relationship with China is concerned. Um, and it is our it is uh, important concern for us that China continues to back Pakistan on issues on which we feel that we have a, we have a a case against Pakistan, including the latest one in the United Nations. But I just think it we need to talk 
to China a lot more than we've done, and we can't take China for granted, which is what I fear the present government may be doing. Thank you. Why don't we open it up to, to questions? Yeah, uh, two questions. One, a uh, very um, uh, factual one, or, or your, your speculation about that. And the second, a uh, little more conceptual. Um, do you think uh, the current government in India did not understand intellectually that the Japanese-Chinese relationship was historically very fraught? that they somehow saw, they did not know the history of that relationship before courting Japan so vigorously. Uh, so that, that's just a, what, what is the speculation? This government did not know the history of that. Uh, yeah, my, I, um, I think it's a larger problem that, that uh, we think the government has is uh, a lot of the foreign policy uh, positions are being taken in the prime minister's office rather than the home of and the foreign office uh, which is not not completely completely unusual uh, because prime ministers in our country have often been in the forefront of foreign policy making and that's not surprising uh, but they generally trust their foreign minister and usually have a foreign minister that they can rely upon and work very closely with uh, and foreign ministers have we have an outstanding foreign service and foreign ministers have have relied very heavily on, on foreign, f foreign policy experts, both within government and outside government. Uh, it seems that, that, uh, that the foreign policy um, formulation now is, is, has been narrowed down to a very small number of people, uh, particularly those who, uh, who wish to see themselves as foreign policy experts but are, are really not foreign policy experts. They are domestic security experts at best or or political or political uh, kind of planners uh, at best, and I think uh, they just took too much for granted. Uh, there wasn't enough foreign policy inputs into that, and I think that they must have realized that they've gone wrong. So that's that's a historically uninformed intellectual inadequacy. Yeah, I suppose you could you could you you could put it that way, uh, but I I think it's just reflective reflective of uh, overall foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Foreign policy inadequacy. Mm -hmm. They may pick up in a f in a few years, but certainly don't have they ha don't have it now. Okay. The conceptual point is this: um, uh, there have been relationships in history which were marked by deep animosity, and then turned around not immediately, but uh, after some steady work. So the latest is the ongoing reformulation of uh, the U.S.-Iran relationship. Yeah. I mean, they, for Iran, America uh, was, uh, whatever term you want to use, enemy number one, and uh, intent upon uh, undermining the Iranian post-79 republic. Uh, uh, United States, to begin with, I mean, uh, my, my Iranian-American friends say that all Iranian uh, uh, restaurants closed in, in the 1980s and they became something else. Um, and that was the level of hostility here because, after all, so many Americans were trapped in that embassy for so long. And every night on ABC, you could hear um, the travails and the suffering of and the misfortunes of those people. Now, um, so uh, the this is one way to, um, what, what is it that led to the reform the, that has led to the ongoing reformulation of US Iran relationship does it have any implications for India and Pakistan would be one way to think about it but i want to add something which i which i read um, uh, some 15 years ago it was very striking so uh, in the, um, um, uh, Pakistan's former ambassador to the United States, uh, with whom I was going to write something before he became ambassador, so that writing relationship ended with that. Um, he wrote in his book um, that um, at, after the peace summit of 1999 between Prime Minister Vajpayee and, and Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, quote, Sharif voiced the hope first expressed by Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, days before partition, that Pakistan and India will be 
it will be saying maybe it was should be but in the I'm, I'm citing will be able to live as the United States and Canada unquote so we know of course that a level of anti-Americanism is part of Canada's nation national psyche Canada says a Canadian I'm now reading from something I wrote says a leading Canadian writer quote seeks to unify its chronically fractured sense of nationhood in opposition to the United States unquote Hmm? Otherwise, French Canada perhaps would break away, but both share a certain anti-Americanism. Canadians never cease to take pride in what makes them different from the United States, a national health insurance system. Hmm? A model of nation building consciously defined as a mosaic, not as a melting pot. Hmm? Um, a commitment to multilateralism and foreign policy. Law showing greater environmental consciousness than in the United States, a pacific tradition as um, uh, of foreign policy, etc. To the idea that we are different from the United States, and we'll show you with pride how we are different. Hmm? <laughs> Finally, Canada has the kind of anti-Americanism that has not come in the way of either Canadian prosperity or economic relations with the United States. Quote: A truck crosses the U.S.-Canadian border every 2.5 seconds. Approximately $1.3 billion in two-way trade crosses the border every day, or $500 billion a year. More than 200 million two-way border crossings occur yearly, making the shared border the busiest international boundary in the world. So the claim here is that Jinnah thought that U.S.-Canada relationship would serve as a model for India and Pakistan. And actually, no, Hussein Akani, if he's listening to this live streaming, Hussein was going to share those documents with me from Jinnah archives and would, was inviting me to co-write with him, explore this idea. Hmm? And I was very attracted to it. So my question to you is then, one, take, taking into account what is changing in American-Iranian relationship and this whole idea initially, is there any way anti-Indianism of Pakistan, I don't know what you want to say about anti-Pakistanism of India, which according to Waliz Raza Nasr, leading scholar, now Dean of Science Hopkins, anti-Pakistanism of India, he argues, is much less intense than anti-Indianism of Pakistan. And anti-Pakistanism is not an existential question. Hmm. Is not an existential question. So keeping in mind all of these thoughts, some are, I'm not sure I've put them very coherently, but yeah. I, there are a certain set of ideas here. Um, I don't know how you would like to react to that. Well, it's uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, my my basic theme was that we've um, we have to be first clear on on what is how do we perceive Pakistan today. Um, for anyone who thinks that Pakistan is a threat uh, to India, um, is I think uh, absurd thought. Frankly, uh, Pakistan in physical terms is not a threat to India. Uh, there is no strategic advantage that Pakistan can gain. Now, we do know that we are both nuclear powers, and the nuclear powers that are not on friendly terms are obviously obviously to be watched carefully um, and would need to be watched from both sides. But as I said, I think both of us know that that nuclear war is not an outcome that either of us wants. Um, there is some terrible mistake that happens uh, if nuclear weapons get into the hands of, of non-state actors, uh, what what would be the scenario is a different matter. But uh, given as we are today, I I don't believe that there is any use for for nuclear weapons between our two countries. But we don't have a clear strategic policy on Pakistan, and I think Pakistan does not have a clear strategic policy on India, um, except. Some element, some element of of <coughs> of disquiet and resentment at what may have happened in the past because of Bangladesh or what may have happened in the past with various wars that we have fought. Um, I think the only motivating factor in in Pakistan is that the army does not uh, has got accustomed to the idea of of keeping India on a hostile on a hostile uh, uh, plate, uh, that if they were not hostile to India, they would have no reason to exist, really, in Pakistan. 
So I think that's that's the worrisome thing. It's not strategic. It's security of their own interests rather than security of Pakistan that they're worried about, um, uh, which is uh, which is something that can be validated or, or, or questioned depending on on uh, what your research inputs are. But I mean, what what would India achieve by by attacking Pakistan. Physically, it cannot be eliminated. Um, and what would be achieved by attacking Pakistan and acquiring Pakistani territory? Uh, the answer is, is, is nothing. There are people in India like Mulayam Singh Yadav who often spoke spoken of a federation of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. But everybody in India think that that's an absurd idea. Uh, it's, it'll be a federation of problems rather than a federation of, of prosperity. Uh, why would we want to take Pakistani problems into into the Indian fold? So I, I think that there is a huge conceptual black hole into which these both sides keep jumping. There is an enormous, enormous uh, uh, opening of, of possibilities for Pakistan if our relations are normal, if there is transportation across India for Pakistan and, and for us ac across across uh, and for them across India, if the pipelines bring gas to them, uh, economically viable because that gas would be would be coming to India. The fact that we are heavily dependent on pipelines and there would be guarantees and those pipelines cannot be switched off. Um, if Pakistan, when it is uh, when it has paucity of of power uh, generation, we could we could supply them with electricity, uh, which is something that they have indicated in the past that they they wish to have, and frankly. The entire Indian market would be open to Pakistan. Pakistan could become a huge manufacturing base for India. So I can't see anything but a win-win situation for, for both of us. Um, but why does it not happen like, uh, like things moving forward with Iran? I think things moving forward with Iran is because right or wrong, there is a clear strategic policy in the United States of America. And equally, there was a very clever strategic political philosophy in, in Iran. And not everything that they thought and they did uh, would they let out into the public. We do far less than what we tell the public. We, we, we get excited and we tell the public things that we shouldn't be telling the public. Uh, the only time things have worked with India and Pakistan is when we've had black back channel talks, uh, when special, specially appointed representatives have have spoken to each other for months on end, and we've seen something something grow into what uh, Kushid Kasuri has described in his book as a as an almost done deal between India and India and Pakistan. But obviously, uh, it didn't work finally because we don't have on both sides we don't have strategic thinking. We just we just end up with political aspirations trying to pull rabbits out of hats, saying like, oh, Kush, if I can do this. I will be, I'll be so popular in the country. So uh, instead of strategy, there is some, some kind of faulted legacy that we both keep looking for. But I said this before, and I'll say it again, that our best bet today if, of peace with Pakistan lies with Nawaz Sharif. I don't think we could have had, in the last 20 years, we've never had anyone uh, better equipped to work towards peace. Uh, he's, very, he's very clear about it. He stated it. He's, uh, he stated it during his elections, and I think that was a very important and significant indication of how committed he is to peace. And our best bet lies with him. And I think what we need to do is to strengthen his hands and give more strength to his elbow uh, rather than score points against him. <clears throat> Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes. <coughs> Sir, I, have, I just want to pick up from what you said earlier about possibly a NAFTA-type agreement between uh, India, Pakistan, and maybe even Bangladesh. So empirical research in conflict has su suggests that no amount of cultural ties or economic exchanges can take place when territories are unsettled. And I think this applies to some extent, uh, to a large extent, to India's relations with China as well. Uh, so as long as the border issue is not resolved with either Pakistan or with China, no amount of increased cultural ties or trade exchanges is going to substitute for this unresolved security issue. And it also seems like no political party, whether it's UPA, NDA, or even 
if uh, a, an arrangement of Jayalalitha, Mayavati, and Mamta comes to power in, in at the center, we'll be able to touch this issue because any loss of territory from India is going to be unacceptable to, to domestic politics. So no political leader is going to touch this issue simply because, in my view, any resolution will have to involve giving up some portion of Indian territory. That's how I see it. So, so what is this? What, what do leaders think? Is it India's position that no territory will ever be given away, or is there a more real politic sense that some amount of territorial adjustment is inevitable if lasting, stable peace has to exist between India and both her, her neighbors? Um, well, very difficult, very interesting question. Um, one, um, one caveat to what you said about uh, uh, as long as there is a territorial issue, um, no amount of cultural or economic, uh, e economic emphasis can change things. Um, there is a, there is a, a counterintuitive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis China on this. Our trade with China is expanding hugely. It is one-sided, and that's our worry, that there is, there is no, not enough trade going from India to China. Um, and we believe that in, on issues of software, on issues of pharmaceuticals, for instance, uh, they could be more flexible. But it is difficult. Chinese are very difficult people to negotiate with. Um, but we are getting enormous amount of China trade coming into India, and China may well have become our second uh, most important trading partner. And it's happened despite the uncertainty. Uh, the number of number of Indians traveling to, to China, for instance, every year is amazing. And the number of Chinese coming to India are far less, but they are coming. A fairly fair, maybe 100,000 are coming, but 4,000, 400,000, 500,000 are going to China from India. So, uh, but China may be special. Frankly, it may be special that despite our reservations and despite our, our concerns, uh, we think that there is no way but improve uh, improve economic relations with China. Uh, China is, of course, uh, investing in 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 something, uh, something which they are very very uh, uh, determined to push through, uh, which is that they want access through India into into the uh, 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 into Burma and and, and the neighboring countries, uh, and they would then, of course, be able to able to access uh, the northeast of India. Uh, and there, there is a worry. There's a worry about how much influence they would have there. But we could do with their investment in our country. And when Mr. Modi took the Chinese uh, president to, to Gujarat, the intention was to get Chinese investment as, as at least a, a, a midterm solution to the problem of imbalance of trade. But the trouble is, uh, as I as I see it, that you know the way people people speak of the Chinese built highway in Sri Lanka, for instance, and and Chinese built hospital here, our people are not yet ready to be do to be doing that. We we have for such a long time, uh, such a long time, we have manipulated perceptions about China in such a way that it take a little time for people to proudly say that this is built by the Chinese. We have no problems about the Japanese. Uh, that the Japanese have built this under their ODA, and the Japanese have built that. We have no no problem about the the Saudis and the Qataris, etc., uh, and certainly no problem about the U.S. investment. But I think it'll take some time for people to accept Chinese investment, which are which are conspicuous and loud and and and, and where writ large over the Indian Indian landscape. But uh, with with Pakistan, yes. Uh, what what you said, your thesis, I think, with Pakistan uh, is important, but we seem we we don't have a pettiness in our approach to China. We have we we have reservations. We have we have some calculations, uh, some worries, but we don't have pettiness. I think we have pettiness with Pakistan, and they have pettiness with us. We say no to things that we have no reason to say no to. They say no to things that they have no reasons to say no no to us. But there is one, uh, one qualification to this. A problem on trade is they often say no to us because they haven't sorted out things within their own system. 
there are their own markets are were in a sense dominated and controlled by a few people and unless those few people can get something out of this uh, uh, they the trade with india they will not relent and they will not let the government open up and give us uh, most favored nation treatment uh, whatever trade they want to do with india they do through dubai so they they're getting access to indian goods but they're getting them through dubai and they're being able to sell them at a cost which is much higher than the cost at which they would get them if they came across from india so i think somebody who understands understands economics needs to work out whether the real problem with pakistan at least on trade is about economics or is it about something else now from our side some very stupid things are being done by people saying we'll we'll dig up the pitch of pakistani players come and play here or or that we'll we'll burn down the auditorium if if mehdi hasan or somebody performs performs here but those are i think just very uh, puerile and 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 silly and stupid uh, uh, political uh, posturing that we do which our leaders i think are showing their lack of capacity in being able to put down firmly you don't need the police to do it you just have to firmly tell them it's not on and the the show will go on uh, but there are a lot of lot of little political bickerings that are bickerings that are causing it so i think on pakistan and on <coughs> china front we have different different considerations and i think different conditions you could still continue with china and go much faster uh but on pakistan uh, it seems that it's going to be difficult the, the question about territorial disputes and trade is interesting you know the mainland china and taiwan of course have an ongoing existential but conflict but, yeah. but but they 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 are as integrated or more integrated than the us and canada and with japan and with japan as well and with their japan. trade trade and investment with japan is 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 uh, remarkable considering that they have a China continues to do a lot of uh, trade with countries it has unsettled borders with. Interesting. Thank you for that question. Yes. Uh, often when I hear Pakistani and Indian politicians uh, talk about uh, the, the relationship between the two countries, um, often it's forgotten that there's a third perspective in this, you know, and that is the Kashmiri perspective. And, that, and within the Kashmir perspective, we can deconstruct what that means. But to often present this, this is a territorial conflict over a piece of real estate. You keep Jammu, we'll keep Mirpur. You keep is without understanding that there is central to this sixty-year relationship is a, a conflict with real people who have their own opinions, um, who have their own political struggle. that continue to this day that pak that um, that the politicians in india and pakistan both countries need to take on board because even in pakistan there are many politicians nawaz sharif who is widely viewed as this way pro business government who has much to gain from relations with india would happily want to put the kashmir issue but the fact of the matter is that both governments can't ignore that uh, that conflict which exists on the ground between both countries. so what even if there's no territorial swap what are the creative solutions we can come to between these two countries recognizing and trying to address this issue instead of sort of trying to wish it away which is not yeah. <coughs> I, i think that's um, that's that's it's a very important very important question um but you would have you would have noticed that uh, uh, although i didn't specifically refer to jammu and kashmir i did say Uh, that a solution to jammu and kashmir that reflects upon jammu and kashmir's um, uh, muslim muslim majority uh, 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 context uh, would affect uh, all muslims in india uh, the worst thing that anyone can do uh, irrespective of whether they have a point of view which they do or pakistan has a concern about them which which it does uh, the worst thing that can happen and for anybody to do would be to put uh, at stake the future of of uh, indian muslims by having the nation say to them see you guys will never learn uh, in 47 you truncated us and now you've truncated us a second time now what more do you want and i think that would be a horrible thing horrible thing to happen which doesn't mean that if their comfort is to be addressed and their security and safety is to be addressed Uh, you overlook and neglect completely 
uh, people who are rightly or wrongly extremely agitated and who've suffered a great deal over a period. Um, Pakistan and India could, could get together and say, let's put, a, put an end to the suffering of the people of Kashmir. Um, right now, we don't even accept that Pakistan has a, uh, has a legitimate interest in Kashmir. Uh, with great difficulty, if nothing is happening and we have to sit down and talk, with great difficulty, uh, we end up saying, all right, we will talk about everything, including Jammu and Kashmir, but we'll start with terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. And then we argue about uh, what shall we call this dialogue, a composite dialogue, uh, and then uh, we switch it off, and then we say, okay, we're switch it, switching it on, but we won't call it composite anymore. We'll call it a resume dialogue, and then we switch that off, and we say, well, resume dialogue has already been switched off, so there has to be something else. So you say we'll have a comprehensive dialogue. Um, so we are, we are still stuck with words and the shape of the table rather than getting to the real thing the real context. Now, for any country, if Pakistan had no interest in Jammu and Kashmir, and they were not provoking any, any adverse actions in Jammu and Kashmir, for any country like India, for a demo democracy like India, what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir would be a very serious issue, would be a very serious problem. The trouble, of course, is that how long and how much can we continue in our times to redraw borders, and how many, how many countries would benefit from an opening up of the issue of redrawing borders? If there is a real, real concern in Jammu and Kashmir, we must address it, India must address it. And I will be happy to say that we haven't been able to do enough. We need to do much more. We haven't been able to do enough. And what we do might still not be considered enough by interested parties. I think we have to be a little more confident, a little more upfront, a little more transparent, and a little more willing to understand than, than we often do, because we are pushed into a corner that any concession that, that we make and anything that we say will be used against us. So whatever I'm saying to you today, I would not have said as foreign minister, because if I had said it as foreign minister, next day there would have been an official statement made from Pakistan saying India's foreign minister has conceded that things are wrong in Kashmir. So, but the fact remains that if people, are, if we can get worried about youngsters in JNU because uh, they are treated badly by whoever, uh, we have to be worried about youngsters in Jammu and Kashmir, and we are. Some of us are extremely concerned and worried. <coughs> um, but are there some final solutions, and there are only certain final solutions? I don't know. Kr Khurshid Kasuri's book suggests that the backtrack uh, negotiations had reached a point where between, between General Musharraf and, and the Indian government, that there was a possibility, an overall arrangement, which would not be a final solution, but would be several steps towards a final solution, in which some kind, some kind of a workable solution would be found for, for Jammu and Kashmir as well. I am very clear that Jammu and Kashmir is not and must not be a territorial issue. Because some element in, in Khurshid Kasuri's book suggests that there was some broad agreement that the line of control could become a permanent border, but be a very flexible and a very, and a, and a, and a very open border, uh, which is uh, the logical conclusion of ha having border trade, et cetera, is that people could come and go easily. There are models, and that's the, the reason why I suggested that, that what happened in Ireland is something to learn from, and I think that tremendous experiences that, that Ireland can offer, the manner in which the inflexible, hostile, volatile, and violent division was overcome. Uh, but it required a lot of statesmanship from all sides, and certainly, certainly, I think some significant role played by the big powers as well. Um, we are we are very sensitive about any big power involvement, largely because I think there isn't enough trust between us and the big powers, at least at least uh, Western powers, and therefore we've always said no intervention, uh, no honest broker. This is a bilateral matter. We have to settle it bilaterally, etc. So that's that's where we are stuck. But generation after generation, this can't continue. And as human beings, I think we have to accept 
that there is a real human problem that needs to be resolved. And uh, what that solution can be, frankly, uh, if I knew that solution, I would be serving government of India, not here telling you, but let's find one. Questions? Yes. Your, your last comment leads to the question of what can the U.S. do, which it has not done so far to help move the process along between Pakistan and India, not not just with regard to Kashmir and Jindu, but also uh, with regard to other issues. Do you, do you see any, any area where the U.S. should be doing something more, or, or any area where it should be doing something less? Well, I, yeah, that's, um, that's again a very difficult question, because uh, uh, what we have expected of the U.S. is don't do anything uh, on one level. But on another level, we've, we have expected of the U.S. is to, to tell Pakistan where to get off. Now, our understanding has been that, that and from time to time, we've, we've, we've said this to the U.S. as well, that we do understand that you can't let go of Pakistan completely because Pakistan is, is your last bet uh, against a chaotic, chaotic region, and that Pakistan has to be prevented from becoming a failed state, and therefore, whatever Pakistan needs, you will continue to do to some extent so that Pakistan continues to cooperate with you. Now, Pakistan, of course, sometimes feels that, that the U.S. is not doing enough, uh, and that it should do much more. There was time when, when <coughs> the U.S. was much more inclined towards Pakistan than, than it, is to, uh, it was towards India. The perceptions, perceptions in India, India have been that the State Department, the State Department in the U.S. over the generations has been very pro-Pakistan. Uh, for various reasons, including the fact that many of Pakistani leaders and Pakistani civil servants have worked very closely with the State Department, whereas India, during the periods of estrangement, uh, saw the, the State Department as, as uh, another version of the CIA, and therefore uh, were targeted in, uh, in, on the Indian streets uh, constantly. But things have changed dramatically in the last, last few years. Um, we've even at some stage talked about being natural allies, though the preferred statement and the preferred phrase that the Congress Party uses is of, of strategic uh, partners rather than natural allies. Uh, again, language seems to make such a difference. But uh, we, we know that the U.S. has a very difficult relationship with Pakistan because of Afghanistan. And therefore, to expect U.S. to just let go of Pakistan is is uh, would be unreasonable. We don't understand why China needs to be that equally uh, connected with Pakistan, because China no longer has a hostile relationship with us. So why would they need Pakistan to be of to be in their camp, as it were, against India? So we are unable to understand about China, but we are very careful about what we say to China. But we're not that careful about what we say to you. Uh, because uh, we think that you can understand our language and, and then we understand your language better than we understand the Chinese language or they understand our language. So that's, uh, that's how, how it is. Once speaking to my counterpart at the UN, uh, when we had decided the Chinese kept voting against us on some issue and that we were abstaining and that we used to vote for them on the Tibet issue, and I said to him, what if we... Uh, have to be uh, not voting for you this time, but merely abstaining, uh, what would your reaction be? And he said, that I would consider a very hostile move. So, I mean, that's the way, that's the way they negotiate. You don't negotiate in the same manner. So I think what, what, uh, uh, what the US, U.S. can do is to nudge Pakistan in the right direction. And for us, the very important right direction, frankly, is is the is the war on terrorism, which for many many years didn't concern you at all, but which today has become a major concern of the United States. So we have a common cause there, we have a common cause, and therefore, even if the and the terrorism war was could be won as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, I think you would have made a great great contribution to uh, to a final solution for peace in in our region. 
The trouble, of course, is that Pakistan now has its own internal terrorism as well. So um, what is it that you can do to f get them to fight their own internal terrorism and in the process insist that they switch off terrorism against India and not look for alibis like non-state actors and so on? That's the, that's the big question. Yes, Natan. Channel. Um, I want to know about the level of consensus that exists among strategic elites in Delhi. So on one hand, we're told that India and Pakistan are within semicolons of finding a solution, but speaking to think tankers and uh, former diplomats in Delhi, one has the impression that this was not a very popular uh, approach, that it didn't have consensus among foreign policy elites. So yeah, I, I think it didn't. I will agree with you. I think it didn't, and that's why the back channel back channel guys were just uh, talking to the prime ministers they didn't they didn't <coughs> talk to anybody else maybe one or two people would be kept in the loop like the foreign secretary and so on i think even the foreign minister uh, was was told on need basis only uh, because the back channels were kept completely quiet and certainly kept out of the uh, the media scrutiny uh, they all felt that they had moved uh, the distance that they were able to cover was because the back channels worked the way they worked. Uh, but that's, it's gone now, because now um, in the present government, they don't like doing anything on uh, as far as back channels are concerned. Uh, although the present NSA is a great back channel man, but he, he likes, to be, likes to be in the public eye uh, even while he's a, he's a back channel man. So it sort of defeats the very idea of being back channel. Um, Brownie points, uh, brownie, brownie points diplomacy is really what this government is, is very keen on. And Pakistan-India relations can't be settled on brownie points. Could I, could I ask something about the uh, Sorry, ma'am, go ahead. I, I, I have had enough chance to, you know, please. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, your ideas about, since uh, the global war on terror, how um, each state has um, used the language of terrorists as a way to um, map over historical um, relationships with non-state actors that are anti-state in both places. And the language of terrorists has been useful for both um, Pakistan and India yeah. as a way to um, silence no, I see. historical things. And then when you, and I'm curious about how you're even using it now terrorism in relation to Pakistan, when it's also relevant to India as well? No, no, of course it's, it's rel relevant to India, but there are, I think that, um, you know, that the UN uh, hasn't really been able to, to finally arrive at a, at a conclusive definition of terrorism. But uh, most people in the world seem to know uh, something, if, if it's a terrorist act, uh, they can tell it's a terrorist act. Um, I mean, looking at what happened in Paris, for instance, there was no need to, to, to have breakfast to decide whether it was a terrorist act or it was just an uh, act of a disgruntled young man. It was very clear it was a terrorist act. You didn't need an explanation. Uh, it was accepted as a terrorist act. In the past, in the past, whenever there have been what are called freedom movements, uh, clearly uh, one, one man's freedom fighter was treated as another man's terrorist. And there could have been there were there could have been a problem there, and today in the world today in the world I guess if you if you ask me to define it I, I guess if we were if somebody was acting within their own confines and their own uh, perceptions perceptions of their own um, nation if you like or their own country if you like uh, I could see that that's not terrorism. Um, bad as it may be, it could still be described as insurgency. And in India, we use terms like insurgency. Uh, we use terms like terrorism. Now, some people use them loosely. Some people use them very carefully. I don't think in any in the Northeast, whenever there's an incident, uh, and there are trouble spots in the Northeast for India, they are never described as terrorist acts. They're always described as, as in, in insurgency. Most uh, of the incidents and, and very, very tragic incidents that happened in Punjab during the Khalistan movement were described as, as insurgency, were not described as terrorism. 
but uh, a lot of the events that are uh, related to related to india pakistan uh, dispute or india pakistan confrontation are often described as terrorism because it deals with people coming from outside india onto indian territory uh, which is akin to waging war on on, on india rather than expressing your your disquiet and dissent in a major in a in a manner that may be unacceptable to society uh, so one view one view the other uh, the idea is should somebody be interfering in your affairs given that you are a country with with borders with defined borders they are now of late some pakistani agencies are suggesting that india is interfering in baluchistan now i personally think if india were to in, to to intervene in baluchistan it would be a terrible mistake uh, of all places india interfering in some place uh, next to us giving an alibi to pakistan to interfere with us but there are media channels some media channels who uh, who attack us for saying anything frankly and openly who have uh, uh, categorically said that india must interfere in baluchistan i think they cannot be a more shameful way of expressing india's attitude towards baluchistan we've had traditional links <coughs> with baluchistan we've had traditional link with with uh, northwest frontier uh, barcha khan was uh, was his heart was in was, was in india he was a close associate of mahatma gandhi but uh, once pakistan and india were partitioned we had no business we could appreciate what barcha khan was doing but of course fortunately barcha khan's movement was a peaceful movement so we could appreciate that but we had no business in 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 interfering and giving him assistance inside pakistan similarly we have no business in interfering and giving assistance in baluchistan but if they insist on on uh, uh, getting hold of somebody to say india is interfering there etc and so on we would demand that uh, we be given we be given some proof that somebody is interfering You said uh, something very, uh, in your remarks, um, very um, thought-provoking. Uh, many have uh, uh, speculated on that. You said, when the army is in control in, Ch in Pakistan, typically the peace is closer. This is the famous Nixon in China argument, right? That the Democrats could not have made peace with China because they were always suspected of not being truly patriotic in uh, certainly in a muscular sense, whereas Republicans are more muscular about, about American nationalism. There, there's no suspicion about that. Therefore, therefore Nixon-China opening could take place. So Nixon-China um, uh, metaphor has been used a lot uh, uh, for this idea, too. And, and, and uh, and uh, it's been suggested that that a, a relationship, a, a, a possibility of peace with even someone like Nawaz Sharif, is much harder because, bec and and if and you, you can say BJP is India's Republican Party for a moment. Right? Let's say muscular nationalism. If BJ, so there is a Nixon available, but uh, but Nawaz Sharif is no Mao because he is not controlling the Pakistani polity. The polity is in control, or the, is much more in control of the army than the than the, the civilian leader. So, is this the basis for your claim that uh, it's normally easier to talk about, or to to make steps towards or take steps towards peace when the army is in power? Well, I'm I'm, I'm going by uh, I'm I'm going by the historical record. Um, this is not an analytical argument, but going by historical record. Um, there is absolutely no reason why Pakistan should have wanted to be friends with us more when the army is in power and less when the army is not in power. But when the army is not in power, there's huge debate. Uh, Nawaz Sharif coming to, to, to Mr. Modi's oath ceremony, for instance, we didn't know till the end that he would come or not because uh, there was speculation on the army doesn't want it and, and along with army, um, Imran Khan doesn't want it and so on. And, and therefore, I felt that he uh, and, and a lot of people agreed that what he did 
uh, was an act of courage that despite people not wanting him to go, he did go and he came. Um, whereas every time uh, there's a general in Pakistan, um, uh, and they've come, there have never been speculation, they've come. In fact, when Musharraf came, he came to Agra for the breakfast, and, and when he was received here, uh, there was there, there was no speculation about, you know, should he be doing it, should he not be doing it. It just seemed so natural for an army general to come and say that we want to, we want to uh, talk. fix things and we want to talk. Now, I think it's for the same reason, the same Nixon-China China, China syndrome. And then when in our country, many of the things that the BJP has tried and failed vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, we would have been lynched for that if we had even done half of that. We would have been lynched. But nobody's even raised their voice as against the BJP. And which is the worrying thing, that they shouldn't, they shouldn't be they, they shouldn't be lulled into believing that what we have done is, is good enough and we can carry on, carry on on this path. Um, I know that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was desperate to go to Pakistan, desperate. And Pakistan was doing very hard for, if nothing else, just to get, take him to Gaa for his, to his village where they had started new projects and where they said we want to make it into a model village, etc. But he didn't have, he didn't have the opportunity to do it because there was just no way, no way that the BJP would have let him do it. And um, after those unfortunate incidents on the line of control, um, he was, he said something which is very uncharacteristic of him when he said, there cannot be business as usual with, with Pakistan. Uh, he, that was not his natural, it was natural style and that was not his natural language. Um, so it's, um, I, I think that, uh, I think there is something about, but that's not uh, the reason why one would wish uh, army rule in, in Pakistan and, and, uh, and BJP to remain in power in India. I mean, if we don't have to have peace with Pakistan, but there is democracy there and there is Congress rule in India, I'd be much happier. Just to add a quick point, though, as, as you know, as well as anybody, Asha, that the Knicks, only Nixon go to China metaphor makes sense only with the Soviet Union sitting out as a, a common enemy yeah, and, yeah. and I guess that my follow-on question would be maybe an, a common enemy isn't needed but what is what will that force be does one need some sort of external force that could push India and Pakistan toward a more peaceful well I mean a lot a lot of people a lot of people believe that uh, and President Clinton tried it and uh, various US presidents do it a uh, lot of people believe that uh, that force that force would be uh, would be the United States of America. But we have traditionally taken the view that we cannot allow a third party intervention. You know, we've been so tough, tough on third party intervention in Indian affairs that we weren't really that happy about the Seventh Fleet coming to help when the Bangladesh war was on. I mean, the Americans had sent the Seventh Fleet to help us. And uh, our attitude was, we don't want your, we won't let you refuel your ships here. You know, we don't want you. Uh, coming and interfering in our affairs. So in that sense, India is different and unique from all other areas uh, areas of, of conflict and, and different as a country. We do, we do <coughs> value uh, our uh, non-aligned position, as it were, where we don't appear to be either as a client state or as an ally of anyone. And the extent to which we made some marginal exceptions, uh, emotionally, as it were, were with the USSR. But even then, we kept saying that we were, we were not aligned. So it's, uh, in fact, the present, present divide in the country is about, although we improved relations with the US, but the present divide in the country is that we are now tilting too much to the US and we are letting US take our decisions. And the normal political argument is, well, despite having followed the U.S. line and ha despite having gone into the U.S. camp, look, you haven't even got visas. Look, you haven't even got any, any comfort on something else, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think we need to sort things out in our own, own minds at back home. And uh, it's important that, that, that we get the right sync with the United States of America. Uh, but we don't have. I mean, we don't have in Afghanistan, we don't have in Iraq, we don't have on Syria. We don't even have on ISIS. 
On ISIS, for instance, uh, uh, Modi would be more than happy, more than happy to align himself completely with whatever the U.S. wants to do. But the country will not accept it, not because they have any, any time for ISIS at all, but the country as uh, uh, generation after generation has been, has grown up on this idea that we don't interfere, we don't join hands with anyone, we don't go to war with any, anyone, etc. And India must not get involved in some, somebody else's problem. So uh, I think that's, that is something that even Mr. Modi can't shake, uh, shake away as far as public positions are concerned. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, maybe on that note, Mr. Minister, I want to thank you for enlightening us, for thank sharing you. your experience, your wisdom. This is phenomenal. Phenomenal for those of us, of course, who study the region, but also for those of us interested in the fate of the thank future of the much. world thank more broadly. Thank you.